Okay, in this example, we're told we have a steady flow of air passing through a converging nozzle. The nozzle inlet, the static pressure and temperature are given here. P1 is 150 kilopascals and temperature is 500 Kelvin and the velocity is 150 meters per second. At the nozzle exit, uh, we're told what the pressure and temperature and velocity are there. Uh, assume steady uniform flow and that the air behaves as a perfect gas with a specific heat ratio. That gamma there is often given as a K. Um, it's just written as gamma here. But the specific heat ratio of 1.4, gas constant for air of 287 uh, joules per kilogram Kelvin, and the specific heat ratio, I'm sorry, the specific heat at constant pressure is 1.5, 1.005 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. So we're asked, is the flow through the nozzle adiabatic? Is it isentropic? And is the flow frictionless? Support all of our answers. So let me just sketch this out for a moment. We're told that we're dealing with a converging nozzle. Looks like this. We're given some conditions at location one. Flow's going this way. And uh, we're also told at the nozzle exit what the conditions are. So, so here, we're given the conditions there. So the first thing we're going to do is just see if the flow is adiabatic. So one of the things we know is if the flow is adiabatic, then the stagnation temperature should remain constant. You have to go back through the notes on this, but if you look back at where we apply, um, it's essentially um, taking the first law and simplifying it down, you'll end up with the following expression if you go through that derivation. Again, you just have to go back and take a look at the notes, but it's, it comes from the first law being simplified down. Uh, but you'll end up with this expression. T naught here is the stagnation temperature. T is the static temperature. There's your velocity. There's your specific heat at constant pressure. And if you're dealing with a, an adiabatic flow, then that stagnation temperature will be constant. So if adiabatic, then t naught one should equal t naught two. So we can, simp we can then make use of that here. We can just check to see if the stagnation temperature at one, which would be the following, equals, and we'll put a question mark there because that's what we're going to check, the same thing, the stagnation temperature at two. And we're given enough information here we can substitute in. We're told t1, we're told v1, we're told T2, and we're told V2, and we also have the specific heat at constant pressure. So we can substitute those in, work out the numbers, and what you'll get is that the T01 does in fact equal T02. They, they come out to be about 511 Kelvin. So therefore, we'll say that the flow is indeed adiabatic. The stagnation, it's a reasonable assumption since the stagnation temperature remains constant. Okay, let's do the same thing now, but for uh, the next part, which is, is the flow isentropic. So if the flow is isentropic, then the stagnation pressure should remain the same. So let me write that here. So if isentropic, then the stagnation pressure should be the same. And our expression for the stagnation pressure will come from the isentropic stagnation pressure ratio expression. So again, you have to refer back to the notes to see how we derive this. But that's the expression for the isentropic stagnation pressure ratio. And we can evaluate um, P naught one and P naught two for these conditions. We know the pressures at one and two, that those are given here. So here's P one, the static pressure P one. Here's the static pressure, P2, so we can plug those in. Now the Mach numbers were not given, but we can calculate those. So remember that the Mach number is just the flow velocity divided by the speed of sound. And since we're dealing with air as an ideal gas, the speed of sound will just be equal to square root of KRT. So we can calculate the Mach number at points one and two, because we know the velocity and static temperatures there. So if we go through and plug in the numbers, you'll see the Mach number at one comes out to be 0.34. The Mach number at two comes out to be 0 0.8. And then when we calculate what the stagnation pressure is at point one, it's about 162.1 kilopascals. This would be absolute. And P naught two comes out to be 149.9 kilopascals absolute. 
So you'll see that P naught one is not equal to P naught two. So therefore, the flow is not isentropic. If it were isentropic, if it was isentropic, then those two would be equal to one another, but in fact we see that they're not the same. So we can't, we can't conclude that the flow is isentropic. Okay, so then the next part of the question is, is the flow through the nozzle frictionless? So the way we can check that is if, so we know that the flow is not isentropic, and we have to think about what kinds of things would cause the flow to be not isentropic. Um, friction or viscosity is certainly one thing that would, that would cause irreversibilities in the flow. Another might be um, temperature gradients, things like that. Uh, maybe, maybe a shock wave uh, could be occurring in, somehow in the nozzle. Uh, the thing is, is uh, there, there's, first of all, there's not going to be a shock wave because the, the Mach numbers are uh, not supersonic, so we know that's not going to occur. So we don't have to worry about that. Uh, really, the only source of entropy generation here in this flow would be from uh, frictional effects. And so, you know, since the flow is adiabatic, there's, there's, there's no... Uh, there's no heat transfer in, into or out of our flow because it's adiabatic. So really the only source uh, where we could change the entropy in the flow would be through frictional effects. We know it's not isentropic, so, um, so the entropy is changing and it's really just the friction that would cause the, the change or the viscous effects. So we'll conclude then the flow must have uh, frictional, or it's probably better to say viscous effects. I should probably say, say significant. It's enough to change the entropy in the flow. Okay. So I think that's all. Oh, yeah, I think that's all we were asked for this problem, all we were asked to do. One other thing I'll do just to add as a bonus is draw a TS diagram for this flow. So here's the temperature, here's the, the entropy on that axis. Here is the stagnation temperature, T naught one, and we know that that's equal to T naught two. Our initial stagnation pressure is 162. It's, it's larger than the stagnation pressure at two. So if I was going to draw an isobar here, so here's our P naught one at a larger stagnation pressure than P naught two, which would be over here. And uh, we have our static conditions, so really we're operating somewhere down here at some temperature T1, and here's our P1. And then if you look at uh, how the, the temperature changes, let's go up here for a moment, you'll see that T1 is 500 Kelvin whereas T2 is 453, so the temperature is dropping. In addition, P1 is larger than P2, so the pressure is also dropping. So what that means is when I draw where my T2 is, it's going to be somewhere down here. It's a lower temperature, and the pressure will also be lower. So you can see that I'm on a, I'm on a curve here for P2 that's less than the one for P1. So if I was going to sketch out this process, Somehow, I don't know the exact details of how we get from point one to point two, but there's some process that takes us from point one here to point two. And you can see that we're getting an increase in entropy. You know, the, the stagnation, even though the stagnation temperature remains constant, the stagnation pressure is decreasing. And for that to happen, the entropy is increasing. So here's where we start at point one, st static temperature, static pressure, stagnation pressure, stagnation temperature, and then we go to point two at a lower temperature, lower static temperature, lower static pressure, lower stagnation pressure, but the same stagnation temperature. These kinds of um, TS diagrams are just helpful for quickly visualizing what's happening in a flow, and also gives you kind of a quick check to make sure that everything makes sense, that you know T2 is less than T1 and P1 is greater than P2, that, those kinds of things. So I encourage you to draw these TS diagrams uh, just, to, just to kind of give you a good feel for what's happening visually in the flow. 
Okay, with that, we'll go ahead and end this example.